The Public Impact of Uniting the Arts and Healthcare in the State of New Jersey. Up next on Carpe Diem. Hello and welcome to Carpe Diem. I'm Dan Gerskis, Dean of the College of the Arts at Montclair State University. Earlier in this academic year, Montclair State joined Atlantic Health System, one of the largest nonprofit health care systems in New Jersey, in the launch of a new partnership aimed at promoting healing arts in health care and education. Here with me today to talk about that partnership and the role of the arts in health care are William Nair and Lorianne Rizzuto. Dr. Nair is a community psychologist and vice president of system development for Atlantic Health System. Lorian Rizzuto is a licensed clinical social worker and the director of behavioral and integrative health services at Atlantic Health. Bill and Lori, thanks for joining me today. Thank you. This partnership was officially launched in September of 2013 at an event in the Castor Theater on the Montclair State campus. At that time, Dr. Susan Cole of Montclair State had this to say. We're here this evening to celebrate the kickoff of what I hope, I really genuinely hope, will be a rich and a substantive partnership between the Atlantic Health System and Montclair State University as we explore together the important new initiatives in healthcare and the arts. Atlantic Health and Montclair State's joint and special focus on the arts and health has, in my view, a very rich potential to illuminate new pathways to well-being. And I'm certain that it will provide us with significant opportunities to offer our community unprecedented access to advances in healthcare through training, service, and research. So Bill, after hearing from Dr. Cole, I think a good place to start the discussion would be to hear a little bit of background on some of the ideas that have uh, inspired and shaped this partnership. Dan, thank you for having us on. It's a pleasure to uh, be here. This really was such a, a natural relationship between our two organizations, and really five words bound us. If you look at Atlantic Health's mission, the first part of that to provide high quality, safe, affordable care, within a healing culture. So those four words, which we adopted as a part of our mission in 2009, really changed everything. So healing for us involves the community. It involves our patients and their families. It involves connecting to community. The other word begins our vision statement, empowering our community to be the healthiest in the nation. And as Susan just said, we share these three attributes of mission. So we teach, we do research, and in our cases, we also share with our communities. And it's that last, how do we empower? So our pathways to that vision are through teaching health literacy, enabling prevention, and connecting with community. This was a great partnership. Innovation through leadership is our second mission attribute at Atlantic Health. And the third is to educate and engage our human resources. We share all of those together, and so it was a partnership that looked like it would help both of us pursue our mission and make a difference in the communities that we serve, both as not-for-profits and both as community trusts. So, Lori, does Atlantic Health System have any other relationships with institutions of higher education? We have several. Um, in our behavioral health service line, we have um, many contracts and arrangements with other uh, universities for internships for master's uh, prepared students who come in for a variety of um, um, practices. Um, some of them are art therapy students, some of them are music therapy students, and so for us having this partnership um, just makes an awful lot of sense. Um, you know, it, healing people isn't only about doing tests and procedures. Um, it's about connecting people in a way that they might not even realize is useful or helpful. Um, when you put an art therapist or a music therapist with somebody, when they're expecting somebody to come into their room and uh, give them an injection or do a procedure, and yet instead you're 
creating art and talking to them. It engages them and helps them through their struggle in a very different way. Mm -hmm. And so the scope of the kinds of relationships that you have, um, how do they compare to this relationship between Montclair State and Atlantic Health? It's very different. I mean, this is a collaborative that is much more far-reaching than the the internship relationships that we have that are on a very individualized level. Um, I know since I became a part of the collaborative back in the fall, um, it's, it's really such an exciting time to be able to be out on the medical floors and talk to folks and, and feel that excitement because it's so much more pervasive than just an individual student with mm -hmm. an individual university coming in, doing their thing and leaving. Uh, so, Bill, you have a unique perspective on this because you're one of the leaders of the organization, a um, unique perspective on the partnership. Uh, I'm wondering what you're th how you're seeing Montclair State, what Montclair State will bring to the partnership that, as you envision it. It's easy to adopt the vision statement. It's easy to change a mission. What does that mean? So we talk about really, as Lori said, 85% of healing takes place once you leave our campus. Your life can be changed forever once you see us. And in our workplace, life begins, life ends, and everything in the middle. In order for us to really impact on that mission, we really need to reach out to the community. So you have diversity, you have centers of excellence at Montclair State, but you have the arts. And so when we look at that other 85%, where do our patients and their families draw strength to heal? As we struggled with what is a healing culture, it's not only within their walls. How do we engage our communities to share responsibility for making change in their care? How do we approach integrative medicine? It used to be hospitals, we did great medicine and we did great surgery. Now that's a third. We look towards the psychological and the spiritual is really the three aspects of integrative medicine. The third aspect is to respect cultural diversity and to teach cultural awareness. Your student body, your faculty, if you look at, at the arts, many cultures, all of which reflect the very changing heterogeneity of the communities that we serve. And the fourth is really to engage our communities, our faith-based communities, all of those aspects. Montclair is a great teaching partner, it's going to be a great research partner, and above all, an opportunity for shared learning. So Lori, I think for someone who's been fortunate enough not to be in a hospital or in need of the kinds of uh, therapy that uh, you practice, uh, I think we'd be interested to, for them to hear a little bit about the various types of creative arts therapy and the ways they serve the patients. Sure. Um, probably one of the most innovative um, aspects that we have um, at Morristown Medical Center is we have our therapy in our crisis intervention service in the emergency room. And we were lucky enough to start that a few years back um, with some grant funding. And when we first had that, some people thought that I was completely out of my mind. Because really, where can, you know, people are thinking, where do you put art therapy when somebody's in a crisis in the emergency room? When really, when you have a patient, now our patients are psychiatric patients, somebody who is acting out, agitated, um, very uncomfortable, or completely the opposite, are depressed and withdrawn. Um, to have someone go in with some markers and some paper and to, to engage them in that um, very distracting kind of exercise, um, they begin to make art with that therapist and they begin to relax and realize that it's okay and they get engaged in that therapeutic relationship. We've had dance therapists and music therapists who have made more noise than you could ever imagine and, and to watch them become, uh, the patients to become alive and, and to relate to other people in a way that they hadn't done before. We have therapeutic drumming. Um, so you can go into a therapeutic drumming uh, group and see somebody, again, who has total lack of uh, confidence, who maybe is depressed, maybe has a difficult time even getting up and showering and getting out of the house. And with the, with the encouragement of the drummer to be able to say just a few little beats, you could do it. And to feel that confidence through just a 50-minute session is really, it's, it's transformative. It's, it's such a gift to be able to have the arts, regardless of what the medium is, in our services because people don't expect change to happen, and it does, and it's, it's, it's inspiring. Uh, so, Bill, I'd like to circle around back to the mission statement, which you mentioned before, and uh, this joint mission statement that we um, issued for the partnership says that it will offer 
unparalleled access to evolutionary advances in healthcare and the arts through training, service, and research. Uh, what I'm wondering is, what is the importance of offering specialized training that merges traditional instruction with service learning? It's a, it's a great question and it's a great challenge. I went back to teaching uh, sabbatical at, at, at Rutgers Community Psychology to doctoral students and I wrote on the first part of the syllabus a great quote from Kurt Lewin, a social psychologist. They said there's nothing so practical as a good theory. The corollary is in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. Every patient is different. Every family brings something. Every disease is expressed in a different way. William Ostler, a Canadian internist, said, I'd rather know what type of a patient has a disease than the type of a disease the patient has. And it really helps us inform what a personalized, a patient-centered approach is. We have a poet on staff. We've looked at developing narrative medicine Paint Your Pain, one of the programs that Maria Lupo, who directs our arts and healing program, encouraged people to use expressive arts, performing arts, the visual arts, to begin to tell us in a way that traditionally we haven't looked at. What's narrative medicine? It's not recording in your chart only the lab values and only looking at here's my, my vital signs. How does a patient experience that? So the idea opportunity for service learning is to take students at all levels of their training and to help engage in this journey towards healing. But to follow our patients, not just when they come to the ED or when they come to an acute care, but also as their outpatients, as they approach end of life care, the entire continuum. That's really, I think, the promise that we have to help educate, not just your students and to learn from your faculty. We have 280 residents. Mount Sinai School of Medicine and the Mount Sinai Hospital is our teaching partner. These residents gain so much from this experience, so they teach as much as we learn. Uh, you mentioned narrative medicine, um, which I think is a concept for people who spend a lot of time looking at nurses coming in with charts and doctors going over charts. Um, I think it's, it's a concept that may be a little bit foreign to them. Is this something that's widespread? Is that the practice throughout the Atlantic Health System? It is. In more and more healthcare, that we're learning that the way in which patients and, and families experience not only their illness or injury, but the healing process, connecting to their faith, the spirituality part, looking at the baggage that they bring, whether that's a psychological depression, whether that's a special needs child, understanding in their language what it means helps us, and, and us is almost 17,000 people. We have 12,000 staff members, 3,200 physicians on the medical staff, and 2,300 volunteers. We represent all disciplines, all cultures, and this melting pot really is an opportunity around the narrative. Tell me a story, but most importantly, tell me your story. To the extent that we listen, to the extent that we can engage our patients, we'll do a better job of caring. And that, I think, raises for me the idea of the Healing Arts Sampler, which uh, is a multidisciplinary arts program for individuals with early stage Alzheimer's and their caregivers. Um, the partnership has discussed incorporating digital media in order to document the storytelling portion of the program. Uh, Laurie, I'm wondering what university students can learn from hearing and documenting this sort of patient and caregiver stories that might come up in this. I think it's what, what Bill said. It's all about the journey. Uh, you know, when you're a patient and you, whether you're sitting in a hospital bed or you're sitting waiting for an outpatient procedure, you're not just that procedure. You're a person who came here and, and you're you brought all of that to that moment and when we're able to interact with our caregivers in a way that they get to know who we are as people, the caregiver then begin, becomes a, a better a, a diagnostician, a better treater. Um, what the students will learn through that is that the value that they bring by documenting someone's journey, talking about who they are and what they bring to that moment in time is such a rich uh, gift for the patient 
but I think the students will be surprised what a gift it is for them, that they'll walk away from it feeling enriched. They'll realize that they have the skills to engage people, to, to learn about, and to become a part of their life. It's, it's, not a, it's not a natural thing to really sit down with somebody and really find out about them. Every day we walk through a life, we say, hi, how are you? And we really don't listen for that answer. Um, when you're doing that storytelling, when you're doing that narrative, and you really take the time to attend to what someone is saying, um, it, it's, it's the partnership of the learning together and bringing that patient to the next place where they need to be, but certainly a gift for the student as well. Bill, while we're on the subject of students, uh, this summer we're going to be offering a summer course, well, it's a summer, so it's going to be a summer course, uh, the experience of arts and healthcare, and it's going to be taught by one of our uh, music therapy faculty, and the course presents students with a broad sense of how the two fields uh, connect and impact each other. And so, Professor Nair, uh, if you're designing the syllabus for this course, the next iteration of this course, what are the topics that you would include in it? Our world is changing, and music and medicine is evolving into a field of practice as well. One of the big changes at Atlantic Health is looking at virtual audiences and looking at, and we'll use a, a prop here, so what's in my pocket today, a huge innovation enterprise in mobile health. These are ways in which we can communicate. As Lori just said, so when you leave us, so on my iPhone is music that has meaning to me. So if I'm in pain, if I'm highly anxious, a music therapist can help me now use, once I leave, how can this help me relax? And empirically, it can reduce depression, it can reduce anxiety, I can take it with me. The second aspect that I'd add to the syllabus is some remarkable advances in the science of music and medicine. Joanne Lowy from uh, the um, New York Beth Israel Hospital gave a presentation about a year or so ago to our group and she was dealing with patients with Parkinson's disease. And we saw a video, maybe 60 seconds long, which I can explain and none of the neurologists in the audience could. This was a patient with severe Parkinson's disease and gait disorder, and he could not walk through a door. He couldn't walk without the assistance of a cane. His gait was entirely imbalanced. This music therapy approach found a piece of music for him with a rhythm and a gait. Once the music started, this patient was able to walk normally without the assistance of a cane or a walker. He could walk through a door. He could make turns on his own. When the music stopped, he returned to the disability he had. Neurologists can't explain that. What is there about music and the connection? that will help us design the syllabus in the future. So how do we take the art and science of medicine and integrate them into new areas of research and discovery? So we're learning at the same time. Music and medicine is an important and an emerging tool in helping patients heal. The mental and the physical, I think, is a, it's an interesting uh, question. One of our pilot programs uh, in this partnership is to bring in some of your fine physical therapists who work with our dance students. Mm -hmm. Um, and obviously there's a, there's a physical aspect to that. Uh, Lori, I'm wondering, is there a mental aspect to that? Sure. Um, I, I spoke to the physical therapist who's been working with the dance students as well, and, and she said that it's been really exciting for her to, um, although it's been a, a very short-lived program so far, um, to work with the dancers to give them the, the tools to become and stay healthy throughout the summer so that when they return in, the, in, the, in September and the fall, that they'll be um, poised for doing the best that they can. Conversely, on the, on the emotional and mental health side of things is, you know, we, we work with people not only who are psychiatrically involved, but those patients who um, are coming in for other medical um, reasons. So there's always that mind-body connection. Um, following up on what Bill said, on the music piece of it, we do a lot of work on delirium, and delirium affects primarily older people. And when you hook the, the patient up with a, um, a playset of songs that they are um, uh, reminiscing with, 
that they become alive with. Um, they are no longer trying to get out of bed. They are no longer trying to pull out their tubes in their arms. So there's that connection in so many aspects, um, whether it's the athlete that we're working with, somebody who's in pain, somebody who is an elderly patient in an unfamiliar environment. Can I add one thing sure. to what you just reminded me of? We talked in the beginning about the, the, the symmetries between us. We have some great complementary areas, so football and dance. You and I sat next to each other after the dedication at the, the dance That's recital, right. which yeah. was remarkable, Extreme, extremely dynamic. And I think two-thirds of the dancers had, were wearing knee braces in each band. It was a very physical it. dance. It was a very physical dance, but also a lifetime where an injury to a professional dancer can be career-limiting or career ending. Dr. Damian Martins, who is an on-the-field New York Jets team doc, had sports medicine for us. So listening to what you just said, our pathway to the vision of prefer prevention. So we can look at, at dancers in a very different way. So what can a pro football team doc have to offer? One of the things that I learned is that 90% of, of, of um, injuries, knee injuries to women athletes, to ACL tears are preventable. We teach high school athletes, dancers, how to run fast. We don't teach you how to stop in a turn. So there's really an opportunity to do a profile, a risk assessment of, of, of dance and other performance. Look at how we can help you now avoid those injuries and then recover as fast as possible. So the, the integrative medicine approach, so what would you think that the football team doc for the Jets and the, and the dancer in training have in common? Keep you healthy, keep you strong keep you away from 3,200 members of the medical staff. And be able to get back to what you do faster. Yeah. Sure, and one of the facts that uh, I've become very familiar with is the percentage of musicians who are injured during the course of a lifetime. And it's a, it's a staggering, staggering number. It's uh, on the order of 90% of all musicians at one time or another will uh, suffer some sort of um, injury specifically related to their performance. Uh, and speaking of performance, uh, some of our dancers are going to be down uh, in, I believe, in, in Morristown mm -hmm. uh, at the facility there. What is the therapeutic value, Lori, of live performance for people undergoing rehabilitation? So the dancers are going to be going to Atlantic Rehab Institute and uh, primarily working with the stroke patients. So they'll be doing a performance for patients who have um, been hospitalized in that facility. So at the very, you know, at first blush, you think, okay, well, it's a, it's a fun, it's entertaining. Um, but beyond that, it's really the cognitive stimulation. It's getting them engaged and becoming a part of the activity, part of the dance. Um, when we've talked to the folks here at Montclair about what should that look like, it really isn't just a performance, but it will be engaging the patients, um, maybe walking over to them and trying to help some of the patients move in a way that gives them some active range of motion from their wheelchair or from their chair. Um, the, the staff are really excited to hear about and to plan, uh, plan for their patients. We're looking at having the stroke group come in as well, and so not only the patients who are admitted, but patients who have graduated from the program, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, you have, this partnership is extending into other areas as well. The Montclair Art Museum is, uh, has also been involved to some degree. Uh, Bill, can you talk a little bit about what's going on there with the healing arts? at the museum? One of the things that we're trying to do, again, going back to this concept of, of narration and looking at how your relationship to the arts can help you. So we've had opportunities for people, particularly with museums. Hospital audiences was one of the early efforts to create opportunities for patients to come and explore those parts of the arts that can help them heal. We have many people who painted at one point in their life who had an appreciation for art, who were performing musicians, as you talked about. So it's not your grandfather's museum anymore. The museums today reach out with community activities. They involve children. They involve special needs audiences. They go to home. And as we look at the opportunity for creating virtual audiences, how can we broadcast an exhibit from the museum, from a, a dance recital here at Montclair, into an elderly, isolated, shut-in patient on a closed circuit or an iPod broadcast that they could look at as well. So museums aren't come to us any more than hospitals today are only visit us when you're sick or critically ill. 
how do we take this to the community and all share in, the, uh, in, that, in that vision of engaging our communities in becoming mm -hmm. well? So the concept of well-being really changes everything for us. It, it's not just the absence of illness, injury, or infirmity. But what can we do to make you resilient? That's our current research, it is on creating more adaptable patients. If I can help you cope, if I can help you deal with what life throws at you, the arts are remarkable adjuncts to, to teaching resilience and to helping you survive what are for many the most difficult times in their life. We have just a couple of minutes. Uh, before we wrap up. So I'd like to close with a question about how we're looking forward and how we're going to move forward. Uh, and um, I'd ask both of you, what do you see as some major objectives for year two of this partnership? Bill, we can start with you. Right. So one of our shared mission attributes is innovation. And it's a challenge but an opportunity for both of us. You talk about curriculum and co-curriculum. You have a multidisciplinary community we have disciplines throughout all of the, the medical professions. It's an art and it's a science. By having that opportunity for us to look at this one shared value, how do we empower? We need to communicate, but we need to do it in a different way, in a better way. We need to teach health literacy. You can help us look at new ways in which we can communicate to our communities, to our physicians, to our allied health professionals in a way the technologies that you have through all of the media. So this will enable us to reach out to our community, which is 1.8 million people in seven counties in northern New Jersey. Lori? And what I would add is I'm just so excited to have the students come to our facilities. Um, as a, as a clinician, I, I can't underscore enough how exciting it is to have students who come with energy and enthusiasm. Um, it helps us recalibrate how we think about treating patients. We need to become more creative. And by bringing in creative therapeutic arts, that brings even another level of um, therapy, of service, of care, that helps us go beyond those bricks and mortar that we're really used to. And, and, and the excitement, the energy is just, it's palpable. I, I can't wait for them to get there. Bill, Lori, this has been terrific. Thank you so much for your time. I enjoyed the conversation. I know people watching this will get a better understanding of this great partnership that's moving forward. So this genuinely exciting collaboration between Atlantic Health System and Montclair State is going forward. And we look forward to its impact, not just here in our state, but nationally and globally as well. If you'd like more information about this or any other edition of Carpe Diem, you can write to us at carpe diem at mail.montclair.edu or you can call at 973-655-5158. For Carpe Diem, I'm Dan Gerskis. Thanks for watching.